hope everybody is healthy, happy, doing well. We are, uh, as we were talking beforehand, we're all getting ready to start start the early voting. So hopefully everybody gets out and does their part and votes. I don't care who you vote for as long as you vote. All right, I'm gonna talk about some, some voodoo lilies, devil's tongues, and skunk cabbages today. You know, aeroids uh, are a group that most people in the South garden with. They may not know they're gardening with any aeroids, but there are an awful lot of them out there. You know, you can tell by the common names, they don't always get all the respect that they, that they should. So what are aeroids? Aeroids are plants in the Araceae family. One of the most common ones is the peace lily, Spathophyllum, sometimes called Jack in the Pulpit. And that's the defining feature for plants in this family. Their flowers are in what's called a spadix, which is kind of a, a tight spike of flowers. And then often, but not always, they are surrounded by a bract that's called a spade. So you have the Jack in the pulpit. It's a big family. The, the greatest diversity of, of the Araceae or Aeroids or Arum family are in the New World tropics, you know, South and Central America, but they are in temperate North America, uh, Europe, Old World tropics, Asia. They're, it's a widespread family, very widespread. It's about 115 or so different genera and maybe, I don't know, depending on your taxonomist, the 3,800 different species. But new ones are being discovered all the time. And despite, you know, some of them having showy flowers, a lot, most of them, at least the, or many of the temperate ones, the ones that are not tropical, um, we grow more for their foliage. Really, many of the ones that we grow for their, you know, even tropical ones we grow for their foliage. But the flowers in this spadix, they can be like this, where they're both male and female, or they can be separate male and female flowers. One of the, the ones that gets the most press, not a hardy one, I haven't gotten into the hardy ones yet, is the Amorphophallus titanum, sometimes called the corpse flower. And people often say it is the largest flower in the world. It is not the largest flower in the world. It's the largest inflorescence. The individual flowers are actually very small. And in these, it's one of the ones that has separate male and female flowers. So the male flowers are up top. And then if you cut a little hole in the bottom because you want to pollinate it, these are the female flowers down at the bottom. So you can see it's a lot of female flowers and then a lot of male flowers. Typically with aeroids, if you have male and female flowers on the same spadix, on the same structure, what will happen is the female flowers will be receptive for pollen and the, before the male flowers are. So these will all stop being receptive and then the male will shed the pollen. So that encourages or, or makes necessary cross-pollination in order to, to, uh, to get uh, seed. Some plants will start with all male flowers. You'll only have male flowers in there. And then as they age and the plant gets older, year after year, it becomes a bigger clump, it'll form female flowers as well. So it, it doesn't, it allows the, the plant to kind of develop before, before expending energy on developing seed, which can take a lot of resources. So aeroids can be a lot of different things. They can be bulbs, they can be vines, uh, they can be shrubs, uh, small trees. There's really, there's really a lot of 
diversity in the family. And that kind of pseudo trees, I guess you would say. But everything from this Monstera deliciosa, the Swiss cheese plant that's, you know, growing two stories in this, this is in a, under glass. And this peace lily, these are both aeroids. This epipremnum or pothos, which, you know, you probably had growing in an office you worked at at some point, is a, these are aeroids. So these are all tropical ones, but it's just to show kind of the diversity that's, that's out there. And some of our, you know, great flowering plants like anthurium are aeroids. And you can see this just, that spadix is pink and the, the faith is thicker textured, but pink, it's still the, the same kind of, of, of plant. Now, often the, the Araceae, uh, the aeroid family is called the Arum family. And that's because we're, we tend to be Eurocentric, the people who are naming these things. And one of the most commonly grown ones in temperate gardens is Aero Metallicum. And that's because this is native to, to Europe. So it's one that has been grown for kind of the longest, longest time. And they're very hardy, zone four, zone five. You get these great model leaves, the spathe flower. And in some cases, it's very white. Uh, other cases, it's more green. Um, there are different selections with different kind of patterns, and, and there's some really neat ones. One thing that's kind of nice about Aero Metallicum is that it, it pops up in the, the fall. The foliage comes up in the fall, flowers, and then you get these seed heads kind of late winter into spring, you know, and you see the foliage is all gone then. It's plants have leafed out. It's, but they're pretty, you know, they can be pretty cool. They'll grow in shade. They will get moved around. Ants will take these, these fruits and move them around and replant them. So it will spread. That can be nice up until the point when it's not nice anymore. You know, sometimes people uh, feel like these can be pretty weedy. I like them. I like them popping up around my woodland, but you know, you do, would want to be careful that you're not right by a natural area where, where they could escape. There are other arums besides Italicum. Arum pictum, not quite as hardy. This is more of a zone seven or so plant. You see kind of these thick textured heart-shaped leaves and that, that great purple flower. This is one of the ones that grows kind of more Mediterranean type areas. So it really wants perfect drainage. Uh, it will really tolerate a lot more sun than the Aero Metallicum, but it can be quite pretty. Another one, Dioscorides, again, that almost that velvety black spadix and, and spade there. It's kind of a little plant, again, that likes that good drainage. We grow these in our scree and our xeric gardens because they, they really want that dry conditions. Now, you get a lot of these, some of these arums in Mediterranean areas and they still are growing there well, despite all the goats that are out there because a lot of arums have oxalate crystals in them. There's some other, other substances that that can bother a lot of animals. So if you know dumb cane, Diffenbachia, the house plant, actually, let me see, let me go back. I have a, yeah, so you're right, right here in front of, of th this is a Diffenbachia. Actually, I guess they've surrounded this with all kinds of aeroids because I see a philodendron, which is an aeroid, and the anthurium. But the Diffenbachia, dumb cane, which is a popular house plant, is it's called dumb cane because if you eat some of it, the oxalate crystals kind of tear up your, your tongue and your throat and make it hard for you to talk for a while. So that's 
it, you got to be you got to be tough to grow where these goats and things are, are grazing in these um, Greek islands and, and Mediterranean spots. Um, one of my favorites is consonatum, uh, which which will tolerate more of the woodland conditions. Doesn't need quite as good drainage. Often when the flower is young, it, it's pinkish like this, although some forms are pure white, but even the pink ones usually go to more of a green white and then you get the, the fruit as well on this. They're pretty plants. Now, another group that a lot of times people grow, I, I, I grow a lot of these, erysemas. My wife always says, why can't you grow something pretty? but I think they're pretty. It's just, you know, beauty's in the eye of the beholder, you know. She married me, so there's no accounting for her taste. Don't see why she should talk about mine. Erysemas are, you can kind of break them out into th mostly three different type of leaf types. You have these trifoliate erysemas, like Erysema grapsospadix from Taiwan, Erysema fargesii from Asia. And Erysema are, they're native here in North America, down to Mexico, but mostly Asia. I, we have a native three leaf one, Erysema triphylum, triphylum, three leaf. The, uh, the other type is what is called pedatisect, which means the, the stem, you can't really see the stem, the stem's behind this leaf. The stem comes up here in the middle, and then it's kind of a horseshoe, the leaf petiole. This, is, this plant is basically just one leaf. And so this is a nice, nice form of the silver center down the leaf, but these are all leaflets, and this is all just one leaf, but it's kind of horseshoe shaped. And that's called a pedatisect leaf, and there are many erysemas that are like that. And then the other is a peltate leaf, where the, the leaf stalk comes up right into the middle of the plant, like this Erysema consanguinium, which is in, uh, was from eastern China, Tianyushan. You can see the flower there. I'll show some flowers in a minute, but that's the Erysema flower. And then Taiwaniana, this is a really nice silvery form that we found in Taiwan. This is a much bigger plant. These can sometimes, this species can sometimes get close to four feet tall and have a leaf that from tip to tip is, is almost three inches. Some of these will have some, especially this form, but some other ones will have these long drip tips that will hang down almost to the ground. They can be really pretty neat plants, but they have kind of these umbrella or bicycle spoke kind of kind of habits. So there is a lot of diversity in the group, and I'm not going to try and go through all of them. I just pulled some flowers. You can see they often have these kind of striped flowers. Many of the, the aeroids have pretty, can have unpleasant smelling flowers. We'll talk about that a little bit more with Amorphophallus. But, but you can see some of the, some of that, the, the strategy. So with the erysemas, they almost always, the spathe almost always is, wraps around the spadix at the base and then curls over in some way. Traditionally, it's just kind of this lid on the, the plant, but sometimes it curls up like this franchettianum. There's a U in there that shouldn't be there or this fargesii or ringens. Sometimes the spathe sticks way out. So you have this heterophyllum where it, the, the spadix all comes out and goes straight up, or this saxatilly that goes down and hangs to the ground. Sometimes it's the spadix, uh, uh, the spathe that hangs down to the ground, not the, the, the appendage on the, the spadix. So they can be different things. And then you have Sicocianum, which has kind of this bulbous topped spadix that's pure white. So a lot of times the flowers are funky. You can get why they're called cobra lilies pretty often when you look at something like that, you know. I can see cobra lily for sure. But some are really pretty flowers that you could put up next to, you know, other aeroids like the 
calla lilies that we'll talk about. You know, this candidissimum with the pink is really quite beautiful. And while most, while many aeroids have kind of a bad smell to attract flies, this saxatile has this delightful kind of lemony fragrance. It's very, it smells very, very good. And that may be why it has a white flower. It may be trying to attract more traditional pollinators, whereas, you know, Angustatum and Franciatum, these brown things have smells like rotting meat, quite honestly. Although with, with the erysema, is usually not so strong that you can actually smell it. But, you know, they rely on flies and beetles and, and those sorts of things for, for pollination. So they really are plants that reward kind of a, a close look. You know, you get the sunlight glinting through some of these pale stripes. And I'm sure those are there to help the flies get to where they need to go, get down to the bottom to move pollen around. But they are, to me, they're, they are attractive. Now they're close cousins and the ones we talked about, I mentioned at the beginning, the, the Amorphophallus titanum that is, you know, kind of the poster child, the largest inflorescence. Amorphophallus titanum is from Sumatra. It is not hardy at all. You have to have a greenhouse for it. But there are some very hardy ones. Amorphophallus conjac is by far the most common. And the reason it's the most common is because it grows so well in gardens and it bulks, bulks up. You know, you plant one plant and in a couple of years you have a patch like this and your neighbor comes by and says, ooh, that's cool. And you, you dig up a few bulbs and you give them to them and then they have a patch like this and, you know, you keep spreading it around. So they're great in the shade garden and, and they're hardy to zone five. I mean, they're, you know, 5B probably, zone six easily. Uh, they do just fine and they bulk up. This in the spring, once, you, once you're bulb, these are bulbs, corms that you plant. Just like most of the erysema are, are corms, but some are more rhizomatous than, than cormus. But in the spring, once they get large enough, they'll start flowering. And so this is just a clump of flowers of Amorphophallus conjac before the foliage comes out. And let me tell you, if you stick your nose in one of those things, you will not forget that smell because it does stink. They also, like, like there are several of these aeroids that the flowers produce heat. They can produce heat that, that raise temperatures quite a bit. And some of the, the ones from very cold temperate areas, the skunk cabbages will actually melt snow up north where they grow. They'll, they'll melt the snow when the flowers come up before the foliage. We, in 1996, we flowered our first Amorphophallus titanum at the Atlanta Botanic Garden when I was there. And in the conservatory, we were monitoring the temperature and it raised the temperature two degrees in kind of the a, uh, antechamber area uh, at the conservatory. So they really can. But as these fade, the, the Spadix will kind of, you know, bend over. It'll all kind of go, go to, down to the ground uh, if it doesn't set seed. And then the, the leaves will start growing. And each plant is an individual leaf. That's one leaf. This one, uh, Morphobalus conjac, you eat it in China quite a bit. You can find it on... Um, this is just on the side of a mountain where they were selling some different foods and things. This is Amorphophallus conjac. The, the bulbs have been kind of mashed up in water and then squeezed out and dried, kind of like tofu, except for it gets completely dry and becomes like a sponge. And they cut it up and cook with it and it soaks up whatever um, liquid it's, it's cooked in. I know a lot of people can't stand it. A lot of Westerners, when they go over there, I like it. As long as whatever sauce it's in is good, it's kind of like a spongy piece of tofu. I think it's, I think it's just fine. There are some selections of it. Most of them would be showing you species, but there are some selections. There's Gordon's gold, which is this beautiful gold one. You can see it's, it's very stable. 
And then you have shattered glass, which in its best forms looks like this. It's a variegated one, but it is not stable at all. You can see this other one here with just this part of the leaf. There's just a little bit of gold in there, not stable. We have it at the Arboretum. I definitely would never buy Amorphophallus shattered glass without seeing it in growth. And even then, if you get one that's really nice and variegated, there is no guarantee that it will be the next year. These are, aeroids are monocots, so kind of in the same group of, of plants as lilies and grasses and those kinds of things. And kind of splashed variegation does not often hold up very well in them. Streaked variegation does. But, but not the kind of splash variegation like shattered glass. But there are other ones. Um, Amorphophallus conjac, these, these leaves on a well-grown one can get four, four feet or more tall. So it'll make like umbrellas. There's, they're growing some down at the South Carolina Botanic Garden that amaze me every time I go down there. It's the tallest conjac I've seen. This leaf stalk from ground to the top on some of them were, was close to five, almost six feet tall. And then the leaf kind of all comes up above that. Uh, it's, it's, they're pretty amazing. A little bit smaller is this Amorphophallus henrii, which tends to take longer to multiply than, than conjac, but it's a beautiful leaf. It's got almost this, when it's young, this almost pink edge to the leaves. And then you get that spathe, spathe and spadix flower. You can see it's not up on a tall stalk like conjac, but right at the ground, kind of blends in a little bit until you smell it. And then it, if it is fertilized, um, you know, you have a couple flowers here, if those are able to trade pollen, you can get the fruit, which are really beautiful blue things, quite different from the arums. Before I had seen Amorphophallus and fruit, I had just always assumed that they were, you know, red-orange, like, like Arum metallicum but there is, there's a fair amount of diversity. Another one that's great, Amorphophallus unanensis. This is one, it's almost like a little cup on a chalice when it flowers, but it's white, so it's, it's a real pretty one. And with, with the Amorphophallus and, and with the Erysemas too, what you get when they emerge, uh, the leaves, this is a leaf emerging, is you get these spikes, these mottled spikes sometimes just pale green spikes, and then the leaves come out. And man, they look like something alien in the landscape. It's a lot of fun to show kids these things as they progress, because it'll be, you know, daily, it'll look different while it's doing this. The spike will come up, you know, come up a little bit more, and then it'll start opening, and this, you know, this weird thing will come out. And in a couple more days, that leaf will be fully open. So it's, you know, it's not this, you know, season-long uh, journey you're taking, but just over the course of a week or two, you can you can really see this happening. And kids like that go out and check and see what the the you know the cobra lily is doing this year, the the corpse flower. Plus, they love smelling them and hear, smelling how much they stink. There's one Cusianus. This is one that where the the first one, the conjac, would flower you know, the, have a stalk and then have this really tall flower. This has a really tall flower stalk and then the flower kind of at the top. And here you can really see the male flower and the female flowers there on the stalk. The leaf isn't nearly as tall as conjac. The leaf's about half the height, maybe two, maybe three feet, but you can see if it sets fruit, it's on this very tall stem. And the, the fruit can be beautiful. Once it gets ripe, it starts falling off, but it goes from green to pink to hot pink to this kind of purpley blue, which I think is spectacular. You know, I just, we don't grow enough perennials for, for their fruit color. We should do more of that. You know, we grow hollies and things, but we need more perennials for, for fruit color. I think this is maybe the last one. This is a little one. This sits just above the ground, but I love this little guy. It's a nice little pink. 
flower, real pretty looking, real dainty looking. And this is a patch of it. You can see each of these is an individual leaf that'll go all the way down to, to a corm. A little story about this. This is a picture I took in my, my first home here in, in, in Raleigh. And it was pretty close to my front door, probably closer to my front door than, than I should have planted an amorphophallus because when it flowers, there is a week or so where it smells pretty bad. And I was having some work done on my house, so I was at home. And the contractor came and he knocks on my door. He's like banging on my door, rings the doorbell and he's banging. And I opened up the door. He's like, he said, you've got a gas leak. We got to call the gas company. You've got a gas leak. I said, no, no, no. It's just, it's just flyers. Like, no, I've been doing this a long time and you have a gas leak. It's like, no. And I took him over. I showed him the plant. And he's like, it's not that plant. I was like, stick your nose in it. And he did. And he's like, that plant smells just like a gas leak. He was blown away with, with that. You know, this isn't as hardy as the Conjac. Most of the other ones that I, that I showed are probably zone 7A, 7B, as opposed to the zone 5, 6 Conjac. But all really neat plants, plants and it's just a, a, a bulb that you, that you plant. Now, and getting to some that you probably didn't realize were, were related, were in the same family. How about sweet flag, a chorus that we grow as a, a great kind of a shade tolerant ground cover or a, you know, a plant for wet areas in the garden, the edges of ponds, low spots. This is one of the yellow forms of a chorus gramineus, which is, you know, zone five hardy. It's a little grassy thing. There's also a chorus Calamus. This is a variegated one, but this is a little bit taller and coarser, a little bit wider leaf for a chorus calamus, which is, I don't know, zone three, zone four hardy. I mean, we'll talk about hardy as can be, but when you see it in flower, you can see. Now, it doesn't have the space, so it's just the jack without his pulpit, but you know, you can see that same flower. And you can see, you know, a little bit more of a relationship to grasses and things. You, this really looks like it's a, a monocot, like grasses and lilies and corn and things like that. But, but we tend not to think about those. Same thing with this, our native orontium. Uh, you know, it's, this grows out in uh, our natural stream pond edges. This is it in flower. Again, you can see that spadix there, no spathe, so, but, and then the little plantain kind of, kind of leaf. So, you know, there are a lot of these out there. You know, this is another one that's you know, zone five, zone six, at least. So now the more, more traditional looking ones. The first time I went hiking in the woods, early in the spring, early enough to see this flowering, kind of late winter, early spring, I was blown away. I was on the Appalachian Trail and there was just this whole kind of damp hillside that went down into a stream that had these, these gold flowers out there. Showy as can be, but this is what's the common name? Skunk cabbage. Um, is this? Is, I, I never can remember what, which skunk ones are. Skunk cabbage. Yeah, skunk cabbage. Thank you. And you know, but then later in the season, you get these big leaves. Now this is this is in a, a garden, but you can see it's it's a low area that's kept permanently damp. These great big, great big leaves. Beautiful. If you see this in the wild, often it's growing with another monocot, veratrum, which has also has big bold foliage, but, but not these, these flowers. And this is one that can, that can come up and melt, melt snow. There is a, a, an Asian form, Kemchatsensis, which has, if anything, even bigger leaves, and then these white flowers, another beautiful, beautiful plant. I have struggled to grow this here. I don't know if it's really possible to grow it here or not. 
you can see it on the in the northwest and in England and in some places in Europe, but I haven't really seen it in the southeast. But I've never tried it either, so I haven't given up hope on it. And related to that is this the Simplocos fetidus. This is it here, the yellow in here are marsh marigolds. Got these big leaves and these kind of weird flowers uh, that that kind of curl up in the, I, I put the wrong name on there. I'm sorry. I put, whoops. I put Simplocos. Maybe Chris can put the correct name in the chat. It should be Simplocarpus. Simplocarpus, not Simplocos. Simplocos is a different genus. These are, you know, zone four native plants. Let me grow up in Was uh, Wisconsin and places like that. You know, I got to check one of my life list plants off when I went to South Africa and I saw calla lilies growing in the wild, Xantodiscia ethiopica. This was my wedding flower, so it's one of the few things I remember from my wedding is what the wedding flower was. So it helps me stay in my wife's good graces because I do remember that detail at least. So it was, you know, it was one I was really excited to see growing in the wild. And a lot of these are, are pretty, pretty hardy. There's been a lot of hybridizing, especially with Xantodiscia raymanii, which has some really great flower color, and the Alba maculata and Eliadiana, which have the white spotting on the leaves you see on, on a lot of them. So this is one called Sunshine that's got these really gorgeous, just luscious yellow flowers on there. I love these, these colorful calla lilies. There's something about that color that I think is, is just luscious. Red socks, mango, mango may be my favorite. And when you look through the leaves with light, these, like, these spots, it's almost like they're not white. It's like they're translucent all the way through. The sun kind of comes through there. Most of these hybrids with uh, Raymanii and the others are, are really zone, probably zone seven plants, maybe a few of them into zone six. There are some forms, I don't have pictures of them, that are huge. Some of the Eliadiana and, and Ethiopica cultivars can grow three or four feet tall. Most will grow in ordinary garden soil as well as in, in you know, this is actually sitting in water right here. It's growing in water. So they're, they're pretty adaptable. And I saw, I saw this growing wild on the side of a table mountain in, in South Africa. So it was, it was growing in pretty I assume it was catching water there, but in a pretty high rocky place. So a lot, lot going on there. They're, they're very, very adaptable and they're tough. Let me tell you, I have a bed at my house, which is mostly supposed to be all hot colors. It's, it's reds and oranges and yellows and golds. And the people who lived in the house before me in that bed that I ripped everything out of, they had calla lilies in there and the calla lilies keep coming up with these pale lavender flowers. And I mean, I tried to rip them all up and then put about two feet of soil on top of them. And then they keep, they still keep coming up. So don't let somebody tell you they're not tough. Now, a couple of ones that are not quite so common. This is one called Ericerum proboscidium. This is one I loved with my kids. They always loved this plant when they were little. It's just a little kind of heart-shaped, arrow-shaped leaf, makes a little brown cover and kind of a shady spot. But what's cool about it to me is this is the flower. And from above, you can barely even see it. But when you get down low, it looks like a little mouse tail. You know, it looks like a little mouse digging in under the plants. And my kids love the little mouse tail plant. They would ask me, is, is the mouse tail plant yet, the flowering yet? And we'd go out and look and check to see in the spring if it was, if it was actually flowering. Uh, and they thought that was just the neatest thing. A 
Another one that's kind of, that's very similar to the, the erysemas are pinellias. Uh, this is one with uh, trifoliate leaves, kind of like a lot of erysemas. In fact, people often confuse these for erysemas. Um, there's a little flower and the, the spadix coming out. Pinellia, some of the pinellias, like Pinellia tripartita, are aggressive garden plants. They will spread and spread and spread, and you may regret ever planting it. You think it's going to be an erysema that's going to take years to bulk up to much of anything, and instead you got this thing that's going all over. I would probably stay away from Pinellia tripartita. But you know, that's me. It is very cold hardy too, zone four probably. There are some other forms of it, like this atropurpurea, which is a little bit darker. And there's a golden form, this unnamed golden form that I had seen. But you can, it's, it's, this is it spreading. The first year from seed, it's just got a heart shaped leaf. The next year, it'll have three leaves. But you can see it's, it's, it's spreading in a Japanese garden. But so I'd be, I'd be wary of that one unless you really know that you really, really want a big, big patch of it. But there are other ones that are, that are not so vigorous. This is Pinellia cordata, has this, again, kind of an arrow shaped leaf and a little green flower. The Pinellias often have the, the spadix sticking up, but not always. This one doesn't run quite as bad, but it will often form a little pseudo bulb. I think you can see one right there. A pseudo bulb right there where the, the petiole mat connects to the leaf. And those can, those, when it goes, the leaf dies in the fall, those can form new plants. So you can get patches of it that way. And if you, you know, rake over it while you're getting leaves out and you rake these leaves out and move them around, you can move those, those little bulbils around to different areas so it'll pop up in different areas. Uh, they don't all do that, but, but Cordata does. Peltata does not run. This has, been, this has been very well behaved for me. This has almost got like an elephant ear leaf and then the, again, the flower. Flowers aren't terribly showy, but kind of fun. Another kind of somewhere between an amorphophallus and, a, and an erysema are the drunk, Dracunculus vulgaris. One of several of these called voodoo lilies along with the amorphophallus. And you can see that spathe and spadix and the leaves which had the white stripes on there. That's very typical for most Dracunculus. There is a white form that we've distributed a couple of times as well. These can form big patches. You'll, you'll have enough to share with your friends pretty quickly. I don't find them a nuisance, but some people, some people aren't crazy about them. But I love that foliage, and these can get to be quite tall. They can get to be as, as you know, five or six feet tall easily. Dracunculus is, you know, this is another one that's, you know, maybe zone six, hardy. I got my first ones in the mountain from somebody in the mountains of Virginia, or it was certainly zone six. They had a whole box of Dracunculus and Sarumatum. I didn't know, I, that was the first time I'd ever heard of either of them, so I was excited to have them. And you can see that big pedatisect leaf, that kind of horseshoe shaped leaf with all the leaflets. There's the flower on it. It kind of, the, the spathe, just kind of peels down and almost lays on the ground while the spadix sticks up. And if you look carefully, you can see there are flies on, on that thing because it does not smell very good. But I, I love this in the garden. It's just such a cool texture. It's such an easy plant. It bulks up so well. I just, just think it's neat. And it's, it sometimes gets tossed into Typhonium, but really probably a different thing. This one may be hardy to zone five. Now, a new one for me just recently is this Sarmatum horsefieldii, and this is like an Lancelot that's got narrower leaves, uh, leaflets. And there it is in flower. It's kind of got a cute little flower there at ground level. 
I just just got this one this year from we got it for the Arboretum from Alan Galloway. Alan Galloway, some of you uh, longtime members of the Arboretum might know him. He had passed away, unfortunately, this this year, but he was a world authority on on aeroids. He went around and collected mostly these bulbous or cormus aeroids like like amorphophallus and and sauromatums and things like that and this is this is one of his collections that was really amazing it's is you know Alan was a great guy so it's unfortunate in that respect that he passed away but he had also recently retired from his full-time job and was going to go be able to spend all his time his, on his full-time hobby, which was going out and collecting these and describing them and describing many new species. Uh, and there's still more for him, uh, new species that were on their way to be described. But this has been a great, great little plant. You know, I don't know the hardiness, certainly zone seven, but I don't know how much hardier it is than that because haven't grown it there, but I really like the texture it's bringing into the garden. And now for something completely different, the Helicodoceras muscivorus. You can see the fly there. This is sometimes called the pig butt arum. I don't know why you would call it that. That spadix isn't even curled at all. <laughs> but you know, another kind of fun one to have in the garden, but it stinks. We've grown it in really well-drained soils and a fair amount of sun. You can see it here growing in a woodland with hostas and things. And this might actually keep the deer away from your hostas if you plant some of these around and flower in the spring and smell bad enough like rotting meat that the deer may, uh, may wind up staying away and not getting your hostas. I'm gonna have to try that out with some of these, see if that, that works. Sometimes the sarmatums are put into typhonium. They kind of move back and forth depending on taxonomists. But you can see that, that you know, similar to the arums, but larger, a little similar to the sarmatums, but this one usually has an entire leaf rather than the pedatisect leaf. And now, you know, this is where people always get surprised. You know, you go from this you know, to this. But our elephant ears, caladiums, all of those types of things are aeroids as well. And what's been done to them in recent years is just nothing short of, of amazing. These Colocasia esculenta cultivars like Kona coffee with this black, black leaf, white lava. There are ones with the leaf is really kind of contorted. Elena, the kind of gold leaf with some red in there, coffee cups. They're held upright on these black stems. There's, there's a lot there and, and more breeding work is being done with them. They're just getting better and better. And a lot of these things that we really did not think were, were gonna be hardy, we're finding or are more hardy than, than we thought. You know, things like Colocasia gigantea. This is an elephant ear that, you know, the, from stem to the top of the leaf on a really well-grown one with lots of moisture, lots of fertility, you know, can be eight or nine feet tall. These are just simply massive plants. And they're hardy in zone 7B. If it gets really cold, sometimes you can lose them. The problem with Colocasia gigantea and, and even some of the Esculentus is Colocasia esculenta typically forms a, a big bulb, and that bulb is what makes it through the winter. But some of the forms, with some of the breeding um, that's brought in other things, and some of the species like Gigantia, they don't usually form a great big bulb, so there's less there to overwinter. So they just, they don't always do quite as well. But, you know, I have this come back year after year, there are some hybrids between some of the different species, the alocasias and the colocasias and other elephant ears. We're finding some that we thought we knew what they were are actually hybrids. 
but there's one that Plant Delights Nursery introduced a hybrid that's called Architecture. And you know, in my garden at home, I have stems that are, you know, eight or 10 inches in diameter that are about two feet tall that the leaves come off of that. That's because we've had a couple of very mild winters, so it hasn't killed it back to the ground. But they do flower and they do have pretty flowers. It's just the flowers are held very close into the, towards the stem. And actually my architecture has good seed on it. So I'm gonna collect the seed from it and see what happens when, whenever a, a hybrid like that sets seed, it's often something interesting comes up. But these have been fine in, in, in zone 7B. So I will finish with uh, a couple of things on our plant sale buggy. So if you come by tomorrow, um, these will be outside our gate. You know, bring a checkbook or bring exact change and you can get, get these plants. We've got an Ardesia, Andre the Giant, the biggest Ardesia we've ever grown. Great shade loving ground cover. This hardy begonia, Chandler's hardy, being sold as Shangri-La. Hardy is a relative term. This has been hardy through the last two winters. They have been mild winters. I would definitely not plant a begonia, a hardy begonia out this time of year. I would keep it as a house plant and plant it next spring. A couple of crinums. We have Alamo Village, which is one of the best heirloom forms. It is really good. The, it flowers over a long, over a long period. The stems tend to stay fairly upright, so it's it's a good one. We have another crinum that we're offering that is unknown what cultivar it is, but it is a good cultivar. And if you take it and you know it comes into flower, we can probably tell you which one it is. I think it's one of the ones from a breeder down in Texas that's may not have really gotten into cultivation much, but it was, it was donated by a arboretum friend. And then the Syningia eumorpha, we had talked about, we were talking about this a little bit before we got started. This is a plant that we didn't think was gonna be hardy uh, at all, but it's been growing really well in the garden. But it's, it's a great one. It's another one that maybe I'd grow as a house plant over the winter and then plant out in the spring, but we have not lost a plant yet of, of this that we planted out. So, and it's flowers over a long, long period of time with these great big uh, white flowers. So pretty cool stuff. I'm gonna stop there and answer any questions people may have. I don't know if you got much in the chat, Chris, that you couldn't take care of, but I'm happy I guess to help. a lot of the questions in the chat. Uh, one good one that I wasn't really sure about was uh, someone asked if any wildlife eats any of the fruit off of like the erysema or morphophallus or, or any of them. Yeah, um, actually they do. I don't know about a morphophallus, but the, but arums and erysema have a kind of a, a, a fatty, coating on the leaf that, that some insectsy ants um, will eat some of those, kind of like the, the arils on some other plants that they'll, they'll take and bring into their ant hills and which makes, is a perfect environment for them to, to grow in. So some of those do do that. In terms of like birds, squirrels, deer, no, I've, I've, I've don't know of any that, that do. A question that was asked privately, and I think it refers to the, some of the calla lilies. They asked, uh, is it that one that smells like lemon? And I've never smelled one that smells like lemon. Yeah, calla lilies can be quite fragrant. They're not always, and not all the selections are, but, but yeah, they, they can be, that have that really nice lemony fragrance. I think that might be the questions that I couldn't do in the, uh, in the chat. Something new just popped up, I think. Tips for moving a morphophallus. All right. If you have a morphophallus out in the garden, you know, they are, they are bulbs. So you just treat them like any other bulb. If you can wait until they start to, the leaf starts to die down, dig them up 
and, uh, and you can move them around. Amorphophallus are fine drying out. Some things don't like to dry out, but they, they are just fine. Just put them on a natural surface. You don't put them on plastic or something like that. Put them on wood or, or stone or something like that. Let them, let them dry out. They'll, it'll have a bunch of little roots on it. You can just let that dry. All those will kind of fall off and, and shed off. It'll just be a, a root. You can move it around anywhere. You don't have to dry it off. You can just dig it up and, and plant it somewhere else. They're actually very, very tough plants, um, as long as they're, you have ones that are cold hardy. And Charlotte just asked if she can separate or divide her crinum in October. So crinum are the plants that you can't kill. You can separate your crinum whenever you want. You can plant them whenever you want. They are virtually impossible to kill. Now, they will break your, they might break your uh, shovel when you're, you're going to separate them and dig them up. They are, once they're there, they are there forever. So keep that in mind. Question, how much sun does crinum need? For good flowering, crinum needs lots of sun. You can grow them in shade and you'll have beautiful strappy foliage, but you might not have very many flowers. They really want sun for flowers. Oh yeah, Chris made a note that the February Nargs lecture is about Alan Galloway and his aeroids. Is that, is, do you know who's, oh, it's, um, it's two young guys that he worked with that, that Amorphophallus titanum is, is the property of a uh, young NC State student, Brandon Huber, who's working on his master's and is such a good plantsman. And then a graduate at NC State who is working at, who's in charge of the conservatory at High Point University, Jason Lattier, will be given that talk. And that's, that should be fantastic because they are two young guys who Alan really took under his, his wing and really, really taught them a lot. I'm, I'm so looking forward to that, that talk just because it's going to be a great remembrance of Alan, who is a really a unknown giant in the plant world. Unless you're heavily into aeroids, you don't know Alan Galloway probably. And, you know, these are two young guys that he really, really influenced and, and helped get some of his plants out too. So that's going to be amazing. Also, um, Arlene made a note that our virtual fall symposium has uh, an amazing speaker lineup, not talking about aeroids, but talking about fall in the garden. And it's going to be uh, fantastic. May I separate hidden ginger in October? So the curcumas, uh, those hidden gingers, they can be a little iffy uh, over our winters. I would really recommend with hidden gingers to wait until uh, spring, very early spring when they start growing. I would separate them then, divide them then. You know, if we have a mild winter, you'd probably be fine doing it in October, but if we have a cold winter, I'd be afraid you, you might lose them. Question, are, are crinum invasive? No, no, they are not invasive. They're just clumping. The clumps get bigger and, and bigger and bigger, but they don't spread around. And there's quite a few, you know, a lot of the crinums are, we have native crinums and they're native to other areas of the world, Africa, mostly, but yeah, no, it was, it was, they're, they're great plants, not, not invasive at all. I think that took care of all the questions, unless there's anything new. Yeah, I'm bummed I'm going to be missing this, everybody, the next couple of weeks. I hadn't really thought about that when I'd signed up, but it's going to be, um, it's going to be a big change for me. That's uh, over half a year that I've been, I've been doing this every week. So I, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not going to see you, but I will assume everybody will stay safe and, and healthy. And, you know, I will do at least one more, you know, as we, as we hopefully get an open up sometime very soon. And 
but I will do at least one more at the end of that, and then we'll figure out how to keep these things going. But yeah, hope everybody uh, can join us for the fall symposium. It's worth it just to see how Longwood does their amazing, huge, and I do this because I can only get it in the camera, but huge chrysanthemum displays. Uh, one of the wonders of the botanical world to see their, their incredible displays and to see Jason's upcycled art that he does. You'd be amazed at what you can do with uh, bicycle frames and wine bottles, it, which I need to look at because I have several bikes in my garage that are never used and I could probably find some empty wine bottles uh, if I really looked. Or make some. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, so thank you all um, thank you everybody who participated in our giveaway I hope everybody who came through for the member giveaway had a good time and everybody who participated in our fall plant sale got some great plants those will all be available for pickup at the end of the month you'll be getting information on that very very soon so thanks everybody